Welcome to the interview series entitled From Suffering to Success. I'm your host, Michael Hart. This podcast series is a forum for sharing our own stories of struggle and ultimately success in spite of learning challenges like dyslexia. My guest today is Sprague Theobald. As I was researching guests for my show, Mr. Theobald just jumped right out at me with this, uh, what I thought was a tremendously inspirational story, quite frankly, on many levels. Uh, in spite of significant lifelong struggles with dyslexia, Sprague has received both national and international recognition for his writing, producing, and cinematography. He's won two Emmy Awards thus far in his career. First one in 85, Theobald won his first Emmy for the documentary The 25... Well, the 25th defense, excuse me, the end of an era. This is a close look at the historic America's Cup sailing races in 1983 when Australia broke sports' longest winning streak of 132 years by defeating the United States. Uh, more recently, in fact, quite recently, Theobald was awarded his second Emmy for the documentary The Other Side of the Ice. Uh, in the summer of 2009, uh, Sprague his son, and two stepchildren took a 57-foot trawler from Newport, Rhode Island, up through the Arctic's infamous Northwest Passage, down through the Bering Sea, and ended up in Seattle, Washington. By completing this 8,500-mile, five-month trip, Theobald's ship became the first production powerboat in history to find and transit the Northwest Passage. Now, that was a remarkable feat in and of itself, but there was a whole other backdrop story or or backstory to this that I think is that makes this trip even more profound. And and, uh, it's all about his what this trip and the impact of his relationship with his kids had for his family. Now, uh, Sprague is also uh, has a written account of his adventure through the Northwest Passage, also entitled The Other Side of the Ice, and that's available at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, IndieBound. Books a Million, and of course, Kindle. He's been kind enough to join us today. Welcome, Sprague. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Michael. My pleasure entirely. Well, it's a rather impressive resume. You do an awful lot of writing for a dyslexic. Yeah, that's the crazy thing about it, isn't it? It's, um, thank God for spell correct. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 I think it's the, uh, the savior of all dyslexics. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and now with the iPad, I mean, it's just, you know, incredible, but... So, I, so as I was doing my research, um, it, you know, in all the press, in all the research that I've done, I, I don't see you talk a lot about you having dyslexia. When did you first so come out publicly, so to speak? It wasn't until, gosh, I was about 30, I think it was. I mean, to, I'm 62, and when I was coming up through grammar school, dyslexia wasn't really well known. It was right. called remedial. And uh, it was basically um, a sign of not trying or not properly motivated. I mean, it's a lot of people who have gone through this. It's a sign of uh, not being intelligent, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't until I was in my 30s that I saw a, a videotape, and I wish I could remember the doctor's name, who showed a small group of teachers what it was like to be dyslexic. And at that point, I mean, moments prior to seeing that videotape, I knew I was smart, but I also it was very confusing. I also thought that it just wasn't bright. I, I don't know if that makes any sense, but I hear I that saw, a lot. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. It's you know something's in there, but you can't access it, and or you haven't been given permission to access it. In any event, I saw this videotape, and the doctor set up various simple exercises on how a dyslexic would read or hear something. And Michael, I was shocked down to my knees, to my socks. I mean, I just sat there with my my jaw open at 30 years old and I I was in tears. Mm -hmm. I said, this is what is going on inside my brain. And excuse me, I started doing some research and that was probably, that year was probably 1992. I started doing some researching on learning challenges and differences and I I started to understand very simply my brain is not wired the same as as quote normal brains mm-hmm. those without dyslexia. Mm-hmm. So I didn't really to answer your question directly I really didn't come out and start announcing it or anything it just it was such great peace of mind 
to me that, okay, now I have an answer that I just went forward life. And if, if, if things didn't work in my favor or I messed up some dates or I heard something incorrectly and inverted the words, it now provided a comfort inside of me that because I knew why it was happening. Mm. So I really didn't find any need to say, well, that happened because I was dyslexic. That happened because that's who I am. That's me. You had more compassion for yourself. Much more compassion for myself. And it was, might be jumping ahead in the interview here, but it was because of the dyslexia. Uh, I, I left the schooling program with absolutely no compassion or, or even liking for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you're telling a, uh, you're, you're implying a, the, the normal stuff that happens with people that are in our age where school people didn't really understand what it was. They labeled you as lazy, stupid. Um, yeah, yeah. And you hear that enough as a little kid and you find ways to check out. You do. That's exactly it, Michael. You find ways to check out. And I can remember feeling, oh, okay, if you say I'm stupid, I'm going to be stupid. So I'm going to act stupid. Hmm. Um, and you check out and you don't care. And I remember this specific day in seventh grade where I said, that's it. I threw my hands up mentally. So that's it. I don't care. I just don't care. And if I could get a D minus, I was very, very happy because I wasn't, I didn't fail. Well, what happened in seventh grade? Um, the specific moment, I will never, ever forget it. The specific moment was the homework assignment was page 14. I went to page 41. It was about adverbs and adjectives. And when I was called on in class by this English teacher, a very large strapping guy who was also a football coach, to answer some questions, my answers were entirely wrong. And he said, did you do your homework? I said, yeah, I did my homework. I mean, mind you, this is, you know, in front of my peers. Mm -hmm. And he put his hand on his desk firmly and said, you had better not be lying to me, boy. And he came walking to my desk. And I just said, that's it. That's it. And he looked at it and he, he, he just he saw I was on the wrong page. And he shut my book and he walked back to his desk. And I just said, I give up. That's it. I could care less. And seventh grade, the way this all worked out was eighth grade was the next grade, and I was a child of the 60s, and eighth grade was when I discovered pot, and I discovered beer, and I thought, ah, here's my friend. This doesn't call me stupid. Mm -hmm. And it was that moment that, you know, looking back on it, and, you know, some 50-some-odd years later, I, I still get very angry at this teacher thinking, why couldn't he have said, hmm, seems to be some confusion, hang around after class and we'll figure out what happened here. Mm -hmm. But instead, it was public humiliation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you used the word in one of your interviews that I've heard so many times, and that is that the school is a very hostile environment. Very, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, what I didn't see in any of your history was the how your parents understood what was going on and how your relationship was impacted with them. That was very interesting. Um, it was almost a perfect storm in many ways. I grew up in a, a single parent household um, in which uh, alcoholism was, was pretty prevalent. And there was some abuse, um, you know, nothing horrific, but enough to... to keep me on guard um, and make me a little distrustful. And my mother did not have learning problems. In fact, she was an algebra and geometry teacher. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. So she could not understand what was going on. And I can remember her, and to her credit, it was trying to motivate me, saying almost like sort of shaking me, you're not stupid. I said, well, here's that stupid word again. Why, why are we referring back to stupid? And then she, she had no understanding of, of uh, letter reversals and, 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 and doing things backwards. But to her credit, somewhere along the line, she read about, I think it's called in those days, they called it left-handed dominance. Mm -hmm. And I was right-handed. Mm -hmm. And th that's as far as she got. Um, she said, you know, it's, it's, it's because you, see, you do things differently. But still, there was not much support. Um, you know, I don't understand why you're getting these lousy grades. The teacher's saying you're not even trying. 
So when I checked out at school, and I think historically you'll find this with a lot of dyslexics, I checked out at home as well. And that was possible because if she's, was she the one that was drinking a lot? Yeah, yeah. She was okay. the one who, you know, come five or six o'clock at night, she'd start drinking. So I could check out very easily. Yeah, and she was checked out already. So She was checked out. She was right. checked out. That worked and, out. Uh, in many ways, I mean, I don't want to paint a bad picture of her. And in many ways, she was a wonderful parent. But this was her way in the 60s of coping. You, sure. you slam back a few drinks, and then everything's fine. Right, right. So now, uh, I always have to ask this question. So you've got this, like a lot of people with dyslexia, this pivotal moment where you said, that's it, I'm shutting down. You have another pivotal moment where you, the light comes on for you. And in this case, it was a friend giving you that video. A lot of times it's a teacher who understands and kind of takes you by the, the scruff of the collar and kind of brings you along. What do you think it is? What was it about you? What was that kernel inside of you that allowed you to keep putting one foot in front of the other and continuing? Because I remember, I, if I read correctly, I mean, you got clean and sober before you found out what was really going on in your brain. Is that exactly, exactly. Yeah. What um, kept what kept you going, man? It's gosh, I've I've asked myself that question so many times and, and um I'm a spiritual person. I'm I'm not a, a, a strictly religious person and belong to any specific church, but I, I don't think we're here alone. And I do remember the very last night of drinking that, you know, it had been just years of waking up in a, a, a single room with a single mattress that was usually probably puke-stained and just filthy. And I remember deciding, I will try. I will call AA. And, the, the, and I got myself to a meeting, and the deal was, if you, quote, you, whoever this is, can keep me from drinking tonight, I will come back tomorrow night. And that was the deal I struck. And that deal, it's been 36 years now, and that is the deal I strike every night. It's, you know, it's, if you show me the direction to go, I will do the legwork. And um, I always, always, always had a belief in myself. I don't know. It, it's just a spark. And it's, I think we all do, no matter how beaten up we are, it's shown in the anger or the retribution of, of a child with dyslexia. If you didn't have a belief in yourself, you wouldn't be mad. Mm -hmm. You know? It's, oh, yeah. wow. That's very interesting. Yeah, that's kind of how I saw it. I mean, there might be a lot of shrinks out there who say, no, nah, that's, that's not right at all. But it's that anger that... I know there's something in me that's good, and that's why I'd, I'd get so, so damn mad about things when it came to education. Well, you may, was, you may not know this, but I am a shrink. So, um, Oh, I didn't know that. Well, there, yeah, and, yeah, but when you say that, it really resonates with me because I always have to ask that question because it's, you know, in your environment, it's your, your failure, 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 failure. And as a young person, you don't have the emotional wherewithal to kind of manage that. So I'm always... I mean, this is the part, I think, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more at the end, but this is a part, I think, where your story and the story of others like you who've been able to succeed in spite of this wiring issue has been so inspirational. If, and if, just, if I can get enough kids to listen to you and the other uh, uh, successful adults like you, then you're going to give them a sense of hope that they may not have right now. That's it. That's it. Exactly. And what I found was, um, gosh, it all sounds so, so trite, but it's not, is I was looking to the exterior for the signs of success and approval. But the, the signs of success and approval were inside of me. So let's roll back to that time in seventh grade when the teacher you know, railed on me. If I was truly in touch then, as I learned to become later, perhaps I could have said to myself, yeah, but at least I did the homework. Might have been the wrong page, but I did it. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's, it's there. It's there. It is inside of you, and it doesn't need to be big. It can be just the simplest of things that, you know, we are the only people who can truly pat ourselves on the back the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. 
ultimately. Well, that's that, so. That's interesting. So we, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move forward a little bit and talk with you about, um, you know, before the trip. You talk about how, you know, you've you had this marriage. It ended. There was a time period where you didn't see a couple of your kids for a really long time. I was wondering, did you ever think about whether how your brain was wired and the dyslexia? Did how did that impact your relationship? with your wife and your kids, you know, before, during the trip, after the trip? It, before the trip, it did impact a little in that dyslexia, as you know, as we all know, doesn't just affect reading and writing. It's, it's your whole life. Right. And I think there were some aspects in my life in which, and it's no fault of hers, but my, my ex-wife didn't understand that uh, there's certain areas that, let's say, I could become frustrated with. Um, there certainly were some times beforehand when I had my personal work to do, when I could see my, my stepdaughter come back with some fantastic grades, and I would have to catch myself rather than grind my teeth. Arr, she's, you know, she's another egghead. To <laughs> step above that and be really proud of her and let her know. And it was my relationship with my son and my stepkids was very, um, a very straightforward lesson for me in that I did to them what I hoped somebody had done for me. Oh. If you come back with a painting from second grade that looks just absolutely awful, praise that painting. Don't spoil the child, but say, that's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Tell me about it. And that oh. just acknowledges the child. And so I think it was a little bit of that that helped. Um, what helped after the trip or during the trip when my stepchildren got to know me a little bit better, and, and my son too, because when we got divorced, he was three, was that as, as a lot of people with dyslexia uh, will, will realize they, they reach for is humor. And if... I laugh at myself a lot because, oh, did I just say 21? Huh, I meant 12. Oh, well. And, and just to laugh. And I think, you know, laughing at ourselves, being able to enjoy our own fallibilities is a huge lesson. Um, such as, and is getting ahead a little bit, but in the book and in the documentary, you'll see that the boat got stuck in the ice. There was no sense of real panic outwardly, but I can remember... We were stuck. There was no place to go. And I turned to my son and said, well, this didn't work out very well, did it? And, you know, it's just, it's just a sense of humor and not taking things all that seriously. Does that make sense? Oh, it's a great, it's a great lesson. I have to tell you that, um, Sprague, you've done an awful lot of work on yourself. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I've, got, <laughs> I've got some really close friends that are dyslexic, and one of my very best friends is now 71, and and I think it's about the last five years that he's really calmed down. Yeah. And he hasn't been really angry, chip on his shoulder, or chip, yeah, chip on his shoulder. And I mean, you obviously did a lot of work really early, it sounds like to I, me. I, I did, and I can remember one counselor saying, nah, you don't have a chip on your shoulder, you got a city bus on your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, it probably helped a lot to be sober, too. It did. It helped a tremendous amount. It just... Um, Sober, getting sober was, yes, breaking a habit, interdependency, but it was also, for me, a, a case of just growing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, professionally, tell us a little bit about the evolution of how you became this kind of global explorer. How did that all transpire? I have a, uh, as I think a lot of adventurers probably have, I have a lack of a filter that <laughs> That should normally say that's not such a good idea, <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's just you know let's see what happens if you know that kind of thing. Um, what's around the next corner? It's it's a curiosity to see things, and on a boat, boats are becoming you know, it was just so many people are going to boating in the last <clears throat> few decades that there are there are fewer and fewer places really to go and explore. And the Northwest Passage was always something in the back of my mind. But um, getting back to the specific question, it's the excitement of the potential of what I might see or the accomplishment far outweighs the, the, uh, the logical reasoning of, you know, you could die doing this. Oh, nah, 
couldn't happen. I mean, I'm not to say I'm in denial about the danger of things, but the excitement of seeing what's around the next corner is very important to me. I would also assume that you see things differently than a lot of people oh, do. Absolutely, Michael. I see things. Um, I, I just, colors, colors are so vibrant for me and shapes and angles. And I mean, that's why I love photography, still photography. Um, and video, it's seeing the relationship, the natural relationship of how formations, angles relate and fit into each other. And it was so much so, uh, several years ago, I was shooting an industrial down in Florida for a boat company. And there was a, a, a boat dealer next to me. And I, we were in Miami and I was on a dock. And I said, whoa, look at the angles of that dock with the, uh, with the skyline in the background. And he looked at me and said, are you just making this crap up? And, you know, it's just, <laughs> so it's it's I think there is a it's there's a very upside uh, to dyslexia and that I think is the sensorial side. Hmm. Do you remember a specific time during the trip when you were in trouble where that atypical way of seeing the world worked helped you out of a bind? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it looked like when we were getting trapped in the ice, it wasn't a sudden trap or capture. It evolved over seven or eight hours that ice started coming up from the south and it started coming down from the north in this passage we were in and we just saw what was going to be happening eventually. And as we got stuck with z nowhere to go, nowhere to go, not an inch forward, not an inch back, or we were held captive in the ice, I can remember at one point thinking, well, hell, I made it through fifth grade. I can make it. Through, I can make it through this. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, you were. I mean, it was like I, I don't know. I don't know enough about what it's like to be in the ice, but the potential there was for you to, to just get your your boat would have been crushed. Is that correct? It would have. Yeah, it would have been crushed, and that was the fate of many people that went up to the Northwest Passage through history to find try and find this shortcut between the two oceans. Um, the the, the most the biggest story being the Franklin expedition, who in 1845 left with two 100 foot boats and 120 men, and to this day we don't know what happened to them. We have no idea where the boats or the the ice just got them, and it will crush you. And we, when we were caught in the ice, the currents were slowly pushing us towards a rock bound coast, which, through the binoculars, we could see these huge ice sheets pressing up against and exploding from the pressure. Mm -hmm. um, I took a bit of a nap, which basically was nothing more than trying to shut my eyes for a few hours. And when I came up, instead of being a mile and a half away from this rock-bound coast, we were now a quarter of a mile away. And um, it, it's very, very, <laughs> it's not an exaggeration or out of a B movie, but death was in the air. Um, I all of a sudden had this vision in my mind that there would be a headline somewhere saying, Father Leads Children to Death. Uh -huh. um, and it was, that was, that was really, I thought that was it for us. And that's when we had to make some very, very hard decisions and try to get the boat turned around and unfortunately use her as a battering ram because I'd, I'd rather sink trying to get out of the ice than be impaled on the rocks. What'd you say to the kids? Um, you know, that was a very hard part of the trip, that in that I was a parent and the leader of the trip, there was a lot I didn't want to share. Uh, and whether I succeeded or not is, is really up to, you know, the kids to answer that. But I, I just, about the most drastic I got was, well, this doesn't look good, and I say we fight our way out of here. What I was thinking inside was, we could be dead either way. We could rip the hull open in the ice or we get crushed on the rocks. Um, the kids were absolutely amazing. They, they took it in and there was no fear. I mean, of course, there was grave concern, but nobody lost it. Um, everybody knew that, you know, we, if we got 10, 15 feet further away from shore, that was a major victory. There were times in which I would download weather charts. Uh, from the satellites to take a look at what storms were coming up and see some pretty nasty storms heading towards us. And I would have to sort of keep that to myself and just say there might be some weather coming up. Let's just, you know, keep our eyes open. But a lot of it I had to keep inside. Wow. Wow. So I didn't realize that.
Yeah. There's, there's excerpts where it shows like your, I think it was your daughter was pretty upset and I thought they probably were conscious of the situation that you got them in. I think they were pretty conscious of it, um, but it was through their grace too that nobody said, oh my God, you know, what's going to happen? We're not going to make it. Hmm. Um, there was an incident in which we did have to get rid of a crew member. Um, he was... He did not have the confidence, and he was forecasting pessimism no mm -hmm. matter what. Mm -hmm. It was a, a tough decision, but uh, it, pessimism in those circumstances, and especially pessimism is a real pet peeve of mine, Having getting back to dyslexia. Oh, boy. Growing up and getting through that, I cannot have pessimism around me because it, it really comes down to the glass half full or a glass half empty, and I just, for my personal uh, uh, happiness, I cannot look at it as uh, half empty. No, you can't afford it. No, you can't afford it because it's what modicum of hope you have just gets trampled mm -hmm. by the pessimism. Well, what, what you looking back, what, what, and this is a standard question, what would you do? Would you do anything differently? Um, no, actually, <clears throat> excuse me, I wouldn't do anything differently. It was, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the bottom line in all of this, which was so cool, is that more than any place I've been on my boat, and I've done about 40,000 offshore miles, in the Arctic, Mother Nature is completely in control. Mm -hmm. Completely. So there's really nothing I could have done to outguest her. Um, maybe, I, you know, maybe I would have brought along uh, some warmer socks. But as far as uh, navigation decisions or even the decision to do the trip, um, I was very, very happy with all the decisions that were made and how they turned out. Well, I thought it was amazing that all three kids went back to school. I thought there Isn't was that... something about that that was really instructive, I thought. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. And there was no discussion during the five months aboard of, you know, education's the best, you need to get your education, which it is the best. But there was no discussion along those lines. And within two months or three months after the trip ended, everyone was back in school. And I think that was just so mysteriously brilliant. It was great. Did your natural child end up having any kind of issues with dyslexia? No, thank goodness he hasn't. Um, we kept, <clears throat> kept an eye out for that when he was younger. Um, nothing to speak of, no big issues. He's been tested. Uh, and <laughs> he's really, really good at numbers, which is uh, a great joy for him to be able to tease me about my confusion with numbers. Uh, you got that from your mother. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Okay, now we're at that stage where we're <clears> going <throat> to finish up in a minute here, but I want to give you an opportunity to send a message out to all the kids who are really suffering and really struggling and are still stuck in that place of yeah. pain and agony on a daily basis. Give us, give us uh, your thoughts. What, what message do you want to leave with them? You know, for kids that are knee deep in it right now and feel worthless and frustrated and angry, you're not alone. You are not alone. Dyslexia, every day, thousands of people realize they have dyslexia. And you're not alone, and it's understood. And if, if, if that gives you a slightest bit of comfort, what really, really, to me, I find is the ultimate victory over dyslexia is if at the end of the day, you can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with your teacher or your parents and look at a paper that, let's say, your grade wasn't as good as you'd hoped for it to be, if you can look them in the eye and say, I tried my best, you just succeeded beyond belief. Because it's not everybody's cut out for education in this, this form with our, our brain wiring. There are all sorts of different ways to be educated. And right now, they're having to go through the, the basic 8, 12 grades and you get through those, and then you find there are other ways in life of, of getting education. And that's where you're going to bloom. That's where life is going to become more exciting for you, a dyslexic, than I think for a non-dyslexic. So if for right now, if you can simply say, I tried my very, very best, you've succeeded. 
you succeeded and give yourself a huge, huge acknowledgement or, or hug for that. Hmm. Well, I think that's a great way to finish for today. I want to thank you so much, Sprague. I mean, uh, I just think that um, so many of the lessons that we've learned just in this half hour, I hope we're just going to get it out there as far and as wide as we can and hope some kids can uh, hear what you're saying and find some solace from it. So, oh, thank you, Michael. And, and, you know, it goes without saying anything I can do, you know, to help spread the word or, you know, if through your site, if kids want to email me with questions and stuff, it's just, you know, I, I'm more, I just really want to let everybody with dyslexic know that it's okay. It's going to be okay. It really is. That's super cool. Well, thank you, sir. It's, it was a great pleasure. Terrific. Thank you. Okay. okay. Bye-bye. In the next week or so, I'll be announcing our next guest for our show, From Suffering to Success. If you have someone you'd like to hear on the show, please let me know. If you have any questions or comments, feel, please feel free to reach me at Dr. D-O-C-T-O-R, Michael Hart at gmail.com. And be sure to sign up for my free newsletter at drmichaelhart.com. Thanks much, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.